that by now. Uh, I'm not really used to uh, conducting formal seminars, so uh, the way I have planned it, this introductory series, it's uh, semi-formal. Uh, I like to call it semi-formal. For you, it might be uh, completely informal, but uh, we want you to keep it light for this first session. The reason, first of all, it's uh, past the lunch hour, and uh, half of you are probably asleep, or at least half asleep. Uh, I would have been too if it wasn't for this session. So, what we want to do in this uh, beginning introductory session is to bring you up to speed with, first of all, uh, the series. Second of all, uh, we want to uh, introduce you to uh, the very basics. How do you get started? What's the first step? That's the idea here. We're not trying to uh, teach you research methodology here. You have your academic writing course for that and uh, you get a lot of uh, time for doing that. What we want to do here is to bring you up to speed with the first step, right? How do you start? And that is one of the most daunting uh, aspects of doing MS or doing your PhD when you uh, land into a research-based program. And there are some of the myths that people bring in from their undergrad times that we uh, want to expel in this uh, first session. And uh, the plan for the first session is I'll talk for a very brief time, I'll uh, uh, introduce some of the things, and then uh, I'll hand over to Amin Saab who will cover some of the specifics of uh, this introduction. So, the whole seminar series is introduction on research. This first uh, session that we're doing, that is an introduction to this seminar series. And what I'm doing right now is an introduction to this introduction to the introduction to research. Right? So, uh, let's begin before I go into a more necessary definition of the uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, rationale, part of it has been uh, discussed by Fazil uh, Basisab. The idea is to introduce you to research, what it is, right? and that's the whole rationale. When uh, we do our bachelors from anywhere, anywhere in the world, the idea is to gain as much knowledge as we can from the existing, uh, existing knowledge base of the world. Right? We land into masters and we're suddenly expected to produce something new. Right? And that is the idea of research. How do you do that? That is the rationale of the seminar series. Okay? Transitioning from your undergrad time to your graduate uh, time when you have to produce something on your own. Right? And what we're focusing on is the first step. Right? Please remember that. Parts of the seminar, again, uh, they have been covered briefly by uh, the HOD. What we're going to do is start with the basics, then we are going to cover some of the tools. Right? Tools in the sense that there are some accepted practices in the world today. Right? People write their research papers in a specific way, which produces a specific shape, specific phase of your research paper. If your paper does not look uh, like a professional's paper, if it does not give that impression of coming from a professional on the first look, your chances of an acceptance go way down. Right? And we uh, discuss a little bit of the importance of having acceptances uh, in the research community. Right? So, learning those tools is not just about learning the tools. Learning those tools is about preparing your papers, presenting your research in a way that it looks professional, right? And it exposes you as a professional to the world, right? Not as an amateur. And that is the idea of presenting those tools here, right? Finally, uh, the presenters are going to be anyone from the faculty we don't know yet. Uh, like uh, Arachudi said, we've come up with this idea of a research seminar and we wanted to start it as soon as possible so that people who have registered their thesis for now can start learning at the same time that they're supposed to be doing their thesis one instead of waiting about three months and then figuring out what they're supposed to be doing. So we're starting now and uh, we have uh, different volunteers from the faculty who uh, basically are going to introduce the different parts of the seminar and we have the details of that as the time progresses. Right. So, uh, the presenters can be anyone from the faculty and you might be wondering uh, why I am standing here in front of you and telling you about research when we have much more qualified faculty here in all uh, aspects. They have more experience, they have more qualifications, all of that. Why am I standing here? So I just wanted to uh, take two minutes of your time to introduce myself, those of you who uh, don't know me. Uh, I am a researcher slash developer, that's how I like to introduce myself other than being a student. So. I like to do research and I like to do development and they go hand in hand. I did my MS in software engineering and uh, 
that was back in uh, 2008, and I'm doing research in system security. I have approximately uh, seven uh, general publications, all of them in uh, impact vector journals, and uh, some of them way below in the 0, 0.0 category, and some of them a little higher. Um, I have approximately again 22 conferences. I haven't counted uh, for about uh, a couple of months, so I'm not sure what the exact number is. Uh, I've also visited for presenting uh, papers. I've been to Ireland, I've been to UK, and I've been to uh, USA. Ireland, I went to Dublin City University. In UK, I went to Oxford University for a conference, and uh, in USA, it was Chicago. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that I spent 4,000 rupees when I went to Ireland. I spent absolutely nothing when I went to Oxford. And when I went to USA, I spent a total of 20,000 rupees from my own pocket. And that is a total of uh, 25,000, less than 25,000 rupees for visiting all the countries. Less than what you would have to spend if you want to go to Karachi for a week. Right? And that is my primary motivation that I can give to you at this point in time. Why do you want to do research? You get free travel. If you like traveling, it's the easiest way nowadays to travel the whole world. Right? You don't have to spend anything. You get free travel if you do research. You write one paper, takes about six months, takes about another six months of uh, haggling with the conference chairs and uh, working out the visa. So one year of effort, you get about one and a half lakh, two lakh rupees uh, worth of uh, travel for free. Right? And you get a one week vacation at least. So if you uh, aren't aware of the benefits of free vacation, free travel, this is something that uh, is the easiest way of doing that. Right? But that's not just the only thing. The free travel is only part of the deal. Travel itself is extremely important. Those of you who uh, have applied to government jobs or any other type of jobs would know that the countries you visited, that is just as much of a credential, credential as is your qualification. right? Because it shows that you experienced the world and uh, you've seen the world. Dunya dekhi hai, jisko kehte hai. So it's part of that. And free travel is not just free travel. It has the word travel in it. And travel is extremely important. What you do is you get opportunities to learn Opportunities that you cannot get in staying in Peshawar or staying in Pakistan, right? Uh, you get to meet the industry leaders. If you publish in good conferences, right, we'll uh, come to the definition of what a good conference is. But if you publish in good conferences, you meet the industry leaders, you meet academia leaders, you meet people who write books that we read here in our courses, right? Uh, the first conference I went to that was for software engineering and those of you who are uh, familiar with software architecture, uh, the guy who wrote it, uh, literally wrote the book on software architecture, that's David Garlin and Mary Shaw, these are two guys from CMU and they were there in the conference. So I got to meet them and basically gain knowledge from them that the book cannot give me. Right? So that is a primary motivation for doing research, gaining knowledge, gaining real world experience that we cannot get, that is simply unavailable while staying in Pakistan, staying in Peshawar, staying in the university and staying in the little software houses that we have here. Right? That is something that research can give you. It's not just writing a paper and Hawaii uh, Marmai, that is not just the idea of research paper. You get to have experiences along the way. You have collaboration possibility as well with those uh, authors if your work is good enough. You get academic excellence. Why? Because you're meeting the people who are writing the books literally on these ideas that we're learning. Right? You meet those people, you get the ideas of what's going on in the world today. What is the state of the art? We say state of the art, state of the art, cutting edge, bleeding edge, uh, all of these uh, new technologies. We talk about them, but we don't really know about them because we haven't met the people who create them. Right? We don't understand the philosophy behind that. We don't know what the process is behind that. What goes on when you create a new operating system? Right? You find that out when you go to a conference in which new operating systems are born every year. Right? You go to a conference where the operating systems are created. When you come back, you teach operating system. You really know why you have written in the book or on your slides what is written there. Right? So that is the kind of academic excellence that you gain from research. Right? Again, it comes from uh, visiting conferences, writing in journal papers, creating collaborations. And finally, it is an exposure to industry that is not available to us in living in Pakistan. Right? Uh, a lot of you have done your uh, masters, the faculty members at least. Uh, they have done their masters from abroad uh, and they understand that there is a huge difference between uh, research here and research in the world, in the rest of the world. It's almost always about the industry when you talk about research in the world. And in Pakistan, it's almost always about academia and just writing the paper. Right? So that is something that we want to drill into you at this point. 
that is why you have to do implementations and that is why you have to create prototypes and that is why you have to publish your papers and go on abroad and figure out what the industry is doing. Right? So that is the kind of industry exposure that we simply cannot get if we don't do research. Right? We can only create websites and softwares, database software, simple uh, applications, image processing at best right? if you don't have the industry exposure. So that is what research gives you and that is uh, how I believe you can motivate yourself even if you want to learn just development and you're doing your MS, it will give you an opportunity to learn what the latest industry practices are. It doesn't have to be purely academic, right? And if you are going to stay in academia, it gives you academic, it gives you academic excellence that you can't get while staying just in the uh, academia and trying to learn from your own uh, experiences right, of teaching. So that is uh, primarily why I believe you should do research. You will get a million other reasons if you uh, look at slides. I mean, I will cover some of them as well with you that why you should really do research. But for me, personally, those are the things that really motivate why I do research. I uh, spend my uh, extra time that I could be spending uh, going to army stadium and kidding around. I, I spend that writing papers. That's my hobby because I see these things coming to me as a result. Right? So, um, and we've been having a discussion uh, I discussed it yesterday with Rajuti Sam, in fact, that if you do write research papers, you do get at least one uh, travel grant, right? fully paid almost. Right? You might have to spend like four or five thousand rupees if you are going to right? And that is especially the case in, uh, in our Peshawar campus here. And that is why uh, we had this uh, thing in the faculty meeting that we decided that almost everyone in past, the past batches, they've done really good research work. But they haven't presented it to anyone. Nobody knows that they've done this work. Right? Why should the world not be included in our findings? Right? Why don't we present it to the rest of the world and get feedback? So that our future generations, you guys, right, you have feedback from projects that have been going on for about two years. Right? A thesis, thesis one, thesis two take at least more than a year. Right? So that effort goes to waste because it is not published. Nobody knows about it. We don't get any feedback from that. So you do the publication and that acts as a currency and it really is a currency. I had one or, one or two of my students ask me in the class why I should be published. Right? If you are going to stay in MS, if you are going to do research, you have to publish to number one, share your findings, number two, get feedback, number three, get future directions right? so that you can do more research. Why would you want to do research? Because of all of these things. Right? So that is the whole idea of this seminar, to motivate you to do this, this kind of stuff. Right? and to bring you speed into how you can do it. Right? And uh, when you start doing publications, the problem is that you have two big uh, choices. It's one uh, huge choice and you have two options there. Do you publish in conferences or journals? Right? Whatever I have told you up until this point, that has been related to conferences, right? other than the feedback portion. When you publish in a conference, you get the travel, you get the immediate feedback, you get collaborations, you get academic excellence, you get industry exposure. What do you get when you publish in a journal? Um, I probably shouldn't say this because it has been recorded, but to be honest, I don't see the immediate effects or even medium term effects of publishing in a journal if you are staying in computer science. I, I've said it time. I've said it time and again. I've even communicated, trying to explain this thing to HEC. Nobody understands me. Nobody agrees with me. Maybe I'm wrong. But my idea is that if you publish in a journal, if you have written a very good paper and you submit it to a good journal now, today, right, September 28th, it will take at least one and a half year for the paper to get accepted, and then another year to get it published and visible to the rest of the world, right? So that is like I don't know, 2013, right? So whatever you've done in computer science in 2011 is almost always going to be obsolete in 2013, right? And that is how long it takes. What is really good about the journal is the archiving reasons for this, right? You get an archive of almost the top selection, right? So if you're trying to do research, right, and you're trying to do literature review, you go with the journal. Because if you get a journal which is uh, published in 2006, Right? And you got a conference which is published in 2006. Right? Uh, proceedings are published in 2006. Both in 2006, the journal is going to have a much, much broader impact on your study. Right? Because journal by definition is supposed to be long term. If you are reading conference papers, they are by definition supposed to be uh, short term. Like I just told you. Right? Conferences are for immediate feedback. Journals, journals are for long term feedback. And uh, 
if that is if you are doing literature review, if you are trying to gain knowledge, if you are trying to publish it and you want immediate feedback, especially in, if you are in your MS, you should go for conferences. That is what I feel. Maybe some of the other presenters can come up with some other arguments. Why, do you, uh, why should you go with, uh, with conferences? Because of all these reasons, they come with a conference. They don't come with a journal. Journal can provide you long term feedback. If you are a professor and you are doing 10 year projects, then fine. Publish in journal, get feedback, improve your project as you go along. But if you are just starting, conferences are the way to go. Right? HEC places much more focus on uh, journals. So if you are going for that kind of effect, fine. Journals should be uh, pursued as well. If you can do them both parallelly, that is ideal, right? But if you have to do one, go with conferences. Right? That is my idea and you can agree with me or disagree. Right? If you are going with conferences and that is what I am going to focus on, there are ways of identifying whether what you are publishing in is a good conference or a bad conference. And they are called tiers of the conferences. Right? They are called tiers just as we have uh, tiered architectures in software engineering or networks or all of those things. Right? We have the top tier which is the top conferences. Right? Every uh, sub area of computer science has its own top tier conference and this is extremely important uh, um, for all of us to know. In whatever area you are trying to do research, if you are in computer security we have the conference called CCS. Right? Uh, please. In security we have CCS. Uh, normal people, and by this I mean to say people who are not uh, being made by security, they call it ACM CCS, we just call it CCS. You have Usenex security symposium, normally just called security by the security people. You have IEEE uh, SNP, security and privacy symposium. These are the top tier conferences. If you are in databases, you have DADB, right? uh, very large databases. Very intuitive, name, very large databases. That's what they target. You have, um, if you are in data mining, you have KDD, right? Knowledge discovery and something, something, right? KDD, it's called. Uh, that again is by ACM. And uh, all of these conferences, these are the top tier conferences. If you publish in CCS and you go to a security guy, all you have to do is tell them I publish in CSS and you got the job, right? That's all there is. If a person who understands security conferences, you tell them I published in SNP and uh, they haven't published in SNP, they will probably hire you on the spot. Right? Because publishing in CCS means you have spent at least two to three years on that one paper. Right? That is what top tier conference means. And you have some postdoc guys underneath you and you have uh, doctors and you have master students, all of those working together to write this one paper. That is what a top tier conference is. Right? Why am I telling you this right now? Because if you refer a paper from a top tier conference in your paper and base your arguments on that, right, then there is very little, little chance for anyone to argue with that. Right? You have your supervisor and he is not letting you through some argument. You have some assumption, he does not agree. Right? Go out, find a top tier conference, find a paper that agrees with your assumption, present that paper to the supervisor and you are done. That is all you need to do. Right? Present it to your external examiners, you are through. Right? They can argue with it. Top tier conferences, there is no, there's no arguing with it. Because that is the industry standard. That is what the top tier is doing. Right? That is what we want to do. After that, you have the second tier conference. You get to the second tier conference by publishing in the third tier conference. Right? Uh, third tier conference is something that all of us can publish into. Right? They are again the top three, right? top three conferences. Very good conferences. But we have a chance. Right? You can get in even if you don't know the program committee chair. Right? You can get in at least. And once you start getting into the uh, tier 3 conferences in uh, security, we have Asia CCS. Right? And if you were in artificial intelligence, you have AAAI. Right? Tier 3 conference in uh, artificial intelligence, you have a type. Right? tools and to the artificial intelligence, something like that. Right? So that's how we know these conferences. We don't even know what they're called. They are so famous that, ev that everyone just knows their abbreviations. Right? And you would get to know them uh, too, even though this, is, this isn't my uh, area of research. So you publish in third year conference, you go there, you meet the people, and you create a collaboration with some guy who has already published in tier 2 conference. Right? And you work with them, and you get a paper, paper published in tier 2 conference. And then you go to the tier 2 conference and you meet someone who has published in tier 1 conference. You present them your idea. If they like it, they write the paper for you, with you. 
right? They give you all the guys who need the implementation, right? They do the implementation for you. You're just sitting here providing consultancy, right? Which basically means that you just read the paper and provide feedback. And you get a tier one conference paper publication, right? And then from there you go on. I haven't uh, broken past the tier one, uh, tier three, sorry. So I can tell you uh, that the other steps work, but the first step definitely works, right? You can create collaborations with tier two people by publishing in uh, tier three, right? So that is how you approach conferences and how that is how you uh, judge the difference between a conference and uh, another conference, right? By figuring out what tier they fall in. And it comes with experience. You won't find any uh, conference website or conference listing website that will, that will say tier one, this, this, this conference, tier two, this, this, this conference. You just have to figure it out with experience, right? And we'll come to uh, how you can do that quickly in a minute. How do you start? That's all really good. That's uh, like five term, uh, five years plan. How do you start? Right? You start by figuring out certain questions. Right? Uh, do you want to talk to a supervisor and do what they're doing? Right? Or do you want to go ahead and do it on your own? Both of these have their advantages and disadvantages. If you go with a supervisor, it's difficult for some, it's easy for others. If you don't have any idea at all, then you go with the first option, obviously. Right? So it's difficult uh, for some to like give up their own ambitions uh, for supervisors' ideas, right? Uh, the good thing is that you work on an existing path. That can either be a good thing or a bad thing. How? Uh, you get lots of help, right? Your supervisor already knows the area, right? He can provide you a lot of help. But the problem there, and that's a huge problem, is that you get market saturation. Those of you who've been doing research, and especially the faculty would uh, recognize the idea of Minex, right? Uh, up until a couple of years ago, everybody in Pakistan was writing papers on Mainex. Every single one. Right? I myself wrote a paper on Mainex and I have no idea what Mainex are. Right? So, everybody was doing Mainex. So, if you went into uh, a supervisor, into a research group that was working on Mainex, then you were working on something that the whole of Pakistan is doing. And if you present a uh, Mainex paper in Pakistan, nobody cares. Because they already know more than you. Right? Or so they believe. So that is a huge problem if you go with an idea that everybody is working on, but you get lots of help. So you have to balance, right? You go with something that many people are working on, but not too many, right? So that is if you want to go with uh, the supervisor's idea. What if you want to do it on your own? If you are feeling rebellious or if you have a very good idea that you want to go with, right? It's difficult for most people because you would be very surprised to see that it's very difficult to get help on research ideas if you don't already have someone working on that. Right. You might come up with a very good idea, but there will be no one to help you even get the first prototype out. Okay. And that's obvious that you won't get any help. But the good thing is, you can explore what interests you. You get the motivation, you get intrinsic motivation. Right? You feel that you want to do this thing because this is a problem that you want to solve. Right? And the idea is to balance novel ideas versus solving problems that nobody cares about. Right. If you work on something that you are interested in, you come up with a novel idea, at least uh, in that geographical uh, portion. Right. Right. So you work on something that is extremely novel, and that is something that don't, nobody else in this, at least Pakistan, is working on. But the problem is that you have to be dead sure that this isn't a dead research area. Why is nobody else working on it? Right? Now, this is the balance between this portion here and this portion here. Everybody is working on something that there is obvious motivation for doing that. Right? You don't have to defend your idea. But you're doing now something that nobody else is working on. Right? Why, like, why do you want to work on it? Right? Either you have an uh, expertise in that area. Right? Uh, when we started doing uh, security research, there were, I guess, only one or two groups in the whole of Pakistan who were, doing, who were working on hardcore security and nobody was working on system security. Right? And we started that and everybody used to ask us why security? Right? When I went for my PhD interview, the first question that was uh, asked was why security? Right? And my answer was because it's my area of expertise. Right? I know all of security, that is why. Right? And if that is your answer, very good. Right? Because that gets rid of all of the problem of uh, no help. Right? So you get help internally. Right? So that is what you have to decide. And I can tell you which one you should do. Right? You figure out, are you intrinsically motivated? Are you going to work on your own? Right? Fine, go with your idea. If you're not going to do that, go with the supervisor and go with the supervisor who's working on an idea that many people are working on, but not too many people. 
right? If you go with someone who is working on something completely obscure, then it's going to lead to many problems, right? So that is something that you have to judge on your own. But if you go with a supervisor, your supervisor can guide you on a lot of things, and the general things we are going to cover in the seminar. What, what happens when you start on your own? Right? And that is something that I want to cover here, and this does not necessarily apply to if you want to work alone, right? It can be applied on uh, if you are working with a supervisor as well. But this, in principle, is something that is applied if you are trying to uh, work on your own and you have absolutely no guidance. Right? That is what we are assuming here, and uh, from here on forward, we are going to give you some guidance. But for the purpose of this session, we are assuming you have no guidance and you start. How do you start? Right? So that is how you do it. First of all, you realize what the difference is between undergrad and master student. Right? And that is what I uh, hinted at at the beginning of the talk. You have to figure out that an undergrad knows absolutely uh, little about almost everything, right? That is what your semester system aims to do, right? Introduce you to everything, teach you very little about everything, right? As much as possible. That is what undergraduate student is, right? He knows a lot about almost everything. When you move into the master's category, you have to know lesser, uh, sorry, you have to know lesser number of things but more quantity. Right? You know a little more about a subset of what you knew before. Right? That is what you have to realize. This is an extreme, this uh, graph itself is supposed to be a joke from PhD comics, but it's very realistic. Right? You have to realize that you are not going to be able to learn everything. You have to specialize. And that is the one word that is, uh, that is persistent throughout your, uh, your master's program. Right? You have to specialize. If you don't specialize, if you create a uh, and a solution that encompasses three or four domains, then you are not doing your masters. Right? You are doing your bachelors all over again. That is what an MCS is. Right? And that is what the difference between an MCS and an MS in research is. That is what the difference between an, a course based MS and a research based MS is. Right? So you have to realize that you have to specialize. And when you get into PhD, then it gets a little weird, but uh, that is not what we are talking about. So, I've had, uh, since I've had a little bit of experience with research, I've had uh, people ask me again and again, how do you start, right? And that is a, a major problem, and that's what I've been saying again and again in this uh, presentation. How do you start? What's the first step? And this is my first five steps, right? This is how I learned research. This is how I've taught about six or seven different people how to do research, and I found it to be extremely successful, right? It almost always worked. I've had uh, experience with six people, all six work, right? So I believe it works. If it doesn't work for you, do let me know so that I don't repeat it to other people. Right? But as uh, of today, I believe it works. That's the idea. This is the plan. Step one, search for a keyword on any digital library. ACM, IEEE, Google Scholar, doesn't matter. Watch whichever you like. Right? Something that will give you access to the papers. And uh, some of the digital libraries will be covered in the course as well. But you search on uh, a keyword that interests you or something that you want to work on, even if it doesn't interest you. Right, something that you target. Sort by the latest papers first. Right, download the latest publications. Does not matter who published it, where it was published, forget about everything. This is completely mechanical. Search for the keyword. Right, sort by latest paper first. Download the first 50 papers. 50 is like, the holy grail. Right? That's uh, at least you have to do 50. If you do 60 or 100, much better. But 50 at least. Download those 50 papers. Start reading the papers and figure out the commonalities. You would almost always find commonalities in those 50 papers. Almost all the latest papers are going to be talking about at least the general domain. right? And you would figure out different problems but in the same domain. You would realize it, it's very difficult to believe at first, but if you really do it, you'll figure out that all the different areas, if, you, if your keyword is specific enough, all of them are going to be talking about the same problem because these people go to the same conferences, they talk to the same people, it's the same group of people, they talk to each other, they convey their problems to each other, they figure out the same problems and they try to solve the same problems, they go back to the conferences and they share the same ideas, so it's the whole same set of problems that they're trying to solve and if you want to solve a problem that is important, that is the way you go and that gets rid of the, uh, the problem that we saw here, solving problems that no one cares about. You are targeting the problem that 50 latest papers are trying to solve. So this is definitely a problem that people care about. Right? So that is uh, my five step plan for getting started. This is something that everyone can do. You don't have to have anything other than an ACM digital library access that we have here. Right? You don't need any other resources at all. 
right? That is uh, my experience that I wanted to share with you here. And uh, just to uh, provide you some other hints on how you can strengthen this uh, plan, this plan is complete in and of itself. Right? You don't have to do anything else with it, but there are some things that you can do to strengthen it. Right? And uh, that is by using Google Scholar and some of the tips that I'll give you uh, right now. Uh, we, we're not going to do it practically, but it's completely obvious, so I'll just give you a screenshot and uh, share with you what the idea is. The important features for Google Scholar that nobody else has is that you get the latest papers. It almost always sorts the interesting papers first. Interesting being a keyword that only Google understands. Okay. Uh, they find paper, you can find papers citing the one you're interested in. You find a paper, you like it very much, you find out uh, a reverse citation. Right? A citation is basically papers that this paper has referred to, right? papers in the past. A reverse citation is, I just, I'm just making that word up, so don't use it anywhere else, please. But a reverse citation is something that uh, the papers in the future which have uh, cited this paper that you are interested in. Right? So things that came after it. Right? So if you are doing the literature review, that is very good. And uh, we will see how you can do that. Uh, creating alerts, that is extremely important. If you are doing long term research and you plan on staying in research, you have to keep abreast of what everyone else is doing. Right? And if you are in uh, an area like, um, I don't know, data mining right? or web mining, People are publishing loads of paper every day. Right? How do you keep up with that? You create alerts, right? and we will see how that can be done. This is an example of Google Scholar. You've all seen it, but I want to uh, bring your attention to some of the uh, features here. This right here is the time. You can have any time since 2011, 2010, 2009, 2008. You can find the latest paper using this method. It doesn't always work, because there are some uh, works in Google, but it almost always works. Right? So you can try that. This thing here, cited by 18, this is the reverse citation that uh, I just talked about. You click on this uh, cited by 18 and you find all the papers which, are ref which have referred this paper after its publication. Right? So you were interested in this paper and you have some idea and you want to figure out if this idea has already been published. You go, you click on the cited by 18 and you download all the 18 papers and you see whether they have already published your idea or not. Right? The final thing, you have this all seven versions you can uh, use. Uh, then you see if there are some PDFs available. Google almost always uh, brings a PDF link here. If a PDF is available anywhere on the net, publicly, it will be available here. Right? So if you don't find it here, the best you can do is talk to someone who has access to digital libraries, go to uh, our LUMS library, I mean somebody discuss that with you uh, briefly, or just try to figure out how you can find it. Talk to your supervisor, talk to your HOD, your, uh, whoever is doing research in your uh, area. Right? The final thing, extremely important thing, is the create email alert. When you click on key, create email alert, you can create an alert on this query that you just searched here. So search on anything, search on any citation, search on anything that you can do on Scholar, and then create an alert. So whenever something new comes up for this uh, query, you get an alert from email directly in your inbox. You don't have to go back to Scholar ever again. Like I have about five or six alerts on different uh, keywords of security, and I get about two or three uh, research paper notifications every day from each category. Right? So I don't have to go back again and again and figure out whether somebody has already done the idea that I'm currently working on. Right? So uh, that makes your life really easy and it makes literature review very easy because Google brings stuff to you. You don't have to go uh, after literature review. But this uh, can only be used after you've done the basic literature review. Right? So after you've done your literature review, you have to keep doing this so that when you are here to present your MS thesis, you can be sure that nobody else has presented that already. Right? Um, and why do you have to know that? You have to know that because there is this uh, huge monster of uh, this thing called plagiarism. Right? Plagiarism is basically using somebody else's work without citing the source. Right? That is the basic definition. It's hugely complicated. It brings in a lot of ethics and all of that. You will study that in your uh, uh, it's called uh, academic writing course. Right? And you study that in detail, but what we are trying to do here is give you a brief idea of how important it is right, to avoid plagiarism. You have your references. This is the paper that your advisor uh, wrote 10 years ago. That is where you start, and these are the papers that your uh, advisor forgot to tell you about. This again is a joke from HD Comics. Uh, these are the papers that you find on Google Scholar, and these are the papers referring those papers. And uh, basically, you have to read all of this stuff. Right? Why do you have to read all of that stuff? Because you have to avoid plagiarism. You have to do a thorough literature review. You have to know everything that is to know about that area. I didn't know, or I hadn't seen that paper is not an excuse. Right? You don't offer that as an excuse and get away with it. 
And the idea is that plagiarism can be intentional or unintentional. If you copy something or if you write something and somebody else has already written that, then it is plagiarism, whether you knew about it or not. It's as simple as that. You write something, somebody else has already published that, that is plagiarism. End of story, right? I didn't know, nobody cares. Right? That is plagiarism. And there is another breed of plagiarism that HEC has introduced. Uh, I haven't seen anywhere else in the world that is, this is uh, implemented, but it's a good idea. And that is called self-plagiarism. That basically means you publish something, you go back, you change the word slightly, and you publish it again. Right? That is called self-plagiarism, and HEC considered it, considers it as bad as somebody else uh, copying off somebody else. Right? So you can't copy off your own papers either, right? as far as HEC is concerned, and as far as any ethics go. Right? Uh, and this is uh, to scare you away from plagiarism. This is HEC's page which has a QA division which has, you probably can read it, it says plagiarism cases under investigation at university slash HEC and there is a list of names there with affiliation which uh, actually have, I have excluded that uh, from the screenshot but uh, it's a list of people who are being investigated from plagiarism. You can get uh, blacklisted. We know people who have been blacklisted and who have gone on to uh, run their own CNG pumps right, after getting uh, listed here. So if you want to run a CNG pump, that's a very good idea. Sorry. Right. How do we figure out uh, at fast and HEC, how do we figure out whether there is plagiarism? We have this software called Turnitin. We upload the paper and we get this view and it shows everything, internet, published papers, journals that we don't even have access to. Papers that uh, students have submitted at MIT or Harvard or whatever that, is, that are not even available to us. Right? It looks it up and it tells you that this thing is copied and you will see that it even figures out that features in D has been copied. Right? So it's that specific and uh, I know of a few people who are sitting here who were burned by this and uh, the word that was uh, found plagiarized was OF OFF and THED. Those were the two words which were found plagiarized by HEC and HEC asked them why they were copied. Right? That is. Uh, what HEC asks. So you have to realize that this is extremely important. If they can ask questions about that kind of stuff, they are definitely going to ask questions about stuff that you have really copied. Okay, so you have to be very careful about that. Our policy here is that HEC's policy is 20%. As you can see, this is the max. This is something that I just uploaded uh, for demonstration. This is 20%. At fast, this would be considered a reject because at fast we have a policy of 15% maximum. 15% right, matches maximum and that 15% includes all of this small stuff. Right, so you can't copy anything, you can't copy 15%, you can't copy anything. If there is unintentional plagiarism of this kind, then that falls under the 15% category. Right, so if it goes beyond 15%, you get a region. Right, uh, to wrap this thing off, I've talked already more than I wanted to talk, but to wrap it off, uh, uh, my two pennies for conducting research, the very first thing is get a website. Right? If you don't have a website, it's very difficult to do research. It's difficult to see the relationship between the two, but it's very difficult to do research and create collaborations if you don't have a website. If I say, like, say it like that, then you probably get an idea of why it's important to have a website. If you have a website and uh, you have your publication there, you have your qualification experience there, it's much easier to create collaboration. Right? And it just works out of the box. Right? Create a website, it works. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to spend too much time with it. Start writing, and that is the most important uh, advice I can give you at this point. I start writing. Forget that you don't have any idea. I forget that you don't know how to write a paper. Forget that you don't have any tool. Just start writing, and everything will come to you automatically. That is the main purpose of writing a research paper, to discipline you about research. Right? If you start writing a paper, you will do the research automatically. Right? And writing the research paper helps you do the research. Right? And doing the research helps you write the paper. So start writing, forget about the difficulties, just start writing, uh, get a template and start putting stuff in randomly. Right? It can be like the thing that they say that if uh, an infinite number of monkeys start typing on an infinite number of uh, typewriters, they can create Shakespeare's or uh, selected works. They can do that. So just be a monkey, start writing. Right? Don't think about it. It really works, believe me. Form a group. Uh, if you're working alone, it's very difficult. Form a group, work in a group, sit together, and even if you uh, feel that the other guy is the weak end, you still benefit from them. I don't have time to belabor this, but it really works. It's, it makes a huge difference if you have uh, a group in which you can work. 
And finally, take part in the standardization. Again, it helps you create collaboration. It helps you learn the industry practices. And it helps you do a lot of other things that you can do without getting involved in standardization. It teaches you the inner working of how the computer has come to be the way it is. Right? And um, that is uh, basically all from my side.